Greetings, viewers out in Twitch land. Thanks for stopping in, as always. Back for another writing session today. It'll be the last stream I do for probably about two weeks. I should be, if all goes well, away. All of next week through the following Tuesday. Uh, perhaps I'll do Tavern Chat Wednesday night, depending how the flights go, and if I feel like I'm up and up and at them on Wednesday. Uh, I, I should actually fully get back to it two weeks from today, in fact, the Thursday. So uh, I'll be taking a little break, which is which I think is good for everyone. I don't think I'll get a chance to do a pop-up stream from abroad, though it might be kind of cool. Certainly won't be a work stream anymore, just to say hi. Uh, if you are just joining us for the first time, from the tones, Twitch TV, like and subscribe that, or follow that rather, if you if you are interested in what I'm doing here, uh, tabletop role-playing game discussions and workflow, and of course, pop on over to YouTube, and that is Fox and Board Games on YouTube. Go to foxandboardgames.com for updates. And Twitch, find us at also at Fox and Board Games. That's the company that I'll be releasing Tales of the Harrowed Land and hopefully a few other games. Uh, perhaps early 2023 is what my estimate is. Mid 2023. And of course. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate all the following, all the liking, all the other, all the other things that are making this possible. It's a great, great thing to be able to do this. So I appreciate everybody tuning in for our Wednesday night kind of open roundtable chats as well as these work streams. So here's where I'm at today. Still working on this section. Um, I find it. You know, I find it interesting that a couple people have said to you something to the effect of, wow, it's, you know, you're really digging in deep there. And we had this discussion last night in terms of the level of detail you put into, say, cultural background in your world. And we've had discussions sarcastically about too much backstory for characters and things like that. And I think... You know, I, then I talked to somebody else after we got off the stream last night about it. And, and I think the difference is, if you go deep into this, the players know and the players feel like the world is more alive. Even if they don't find out every single detail, you know, even if they never have to know, you know, all the given, all the given surnames or given names of a, of a particular culture... You know, I think it's just so much more detailed. Oh, there's Bob. Hello, Bobicus. Um, there's so much more detail and depth if you have this even in the background. I know this from all the other creative things I do, art and music. You know, you can you can get away with wowing people with just a little bit, and it looks very impressive. But if you take the time and really put detail in really take care to make sure things are um, complete thoughts. I feel that it just adds this whole other level to the game or to the experience, whatever it is. And as I said, I've had this discussion with people working on you know music projects and fine art projects. You know, well, we could just do this and get away with it. Well, one, why not? If it doesn't take that much extra time, work, or money, or whatever, make something interesting and deep and complex. Because I think you are, your your followers, your friends, your fans, whatever, are going to know that. They're going to know that there's something special there. So I think when I last worked on this, I got through Persona, creating the Persona and using the concept building example. So now, time to review the nuts and bolts. Time to review the attributes.
Time to review the actually building the character part. See where we're at. I've been I've actually spent for the past two days kind of trying to pick through some answers uh, as far as the chat delay. And, and I don't find any other examples of it or replication of it. So I can't believe I'm the only one who's noticed this with this particular setup, but maybe I am. I mean, the solution is I just have to manually refresh it, manually click back to chat regularly. Oh, good. So, so yeah. So, I think, I think coming up with it's interesting is a good end result for play testing. Um, now, do you, you fishbowled it, meaning it was very encapsulated. And like I said, when I started this game, that's what I did. I'd get two people on, give them six rules, and be like, here, we'll work on this for two hours uh, and see what happens. But I don't know, did you try it with other people yet? Or I think it's interesting. Like I said, I think tying the attributes into the challenges makes it more um, engrossing for, for the players. Instead of it being this totally separate system that exists outside the character. And outside of the demographic of the... Or outside of the paradigm of the game. Oh, good. It's always exciting to have people to try these things with. Like I mentioned, part of my task going away, I won't really get to a lot of game writing. But I do plan to do... I do plan to... Um, work on some, the play, some of the play test and jam for hire stuff that I've been kind of hinting around at for a while. A couple scenarios. Maybe one for 5e, one for Call of Cthulhu, my game, and then put those up on Roll Twenty or whatever. We'll see how see how it goes. It'll be interesting. Yeah, you know, and I had a lot of discussions with Tom when we were working on Blight Realms about the narrative tie-in for all this stuff and obviously as a, as a writer I think it's you know I think it's necessary I don't I think it's silly to not have a narrative tie-in but it's some but sometimes you just also need the system to go in and work and if it's doing that you don't necessarily need to have necessarily this deep deep narrative reason for every detail sometimes it, you just have to admit it's just part of a game system
basic stats, the Tales of Higher Land, physical. <laughs> Everyone's excited for our first full run D and D session of a new campaign tonight. From Blake, who hasn't run a game in quite a while. He used to run games pretty regularly for me and for our other friends at the time. We're all excited. I'm excited to play just straight up D&D. &D. None of this fancy stuff. None of this new art game stuff. Just D&D. &D. Straight up test of the 20 sided die. There he is. There's Blake. Yeah, tell me about it. Well, that's how I feel when I was going through some of the rule rewrites earlier this week and I realized there were just whole sections of things that when I transferred them over, I left them out. And then, of course, I had to go back and change the character sheet. I had to change the quick quick creation guide that I wrote up. I'm like, really? <laughs> you know, and so happens when you're doing 30 things at once. Yeah, we're excited for it. Tom, Tom's, I mean, we're all excited, but Tom's really excited, which is awesome. It'll be fun. I still think you should have run first dead. There's Tom. It's true. I mean, it's true. And even though I, you know, I, of course, bust on D&D &D and there are all these other games to play and I say how much I like more, I like Pathfinder. The reality is D&D &D is D&D. &D. You sit down to play it. You're doing something that you've done and that has always given you pleasure and comfort and made friends and all these other things. Yeah, and Fifth Ed is solid. And again, like I said, I, I would almost like to see other things in Fifth Ed, but... For what you need it for, it's great. I mean, it's not anything, you know... It's not anything you need to do anything else to, to play effectively. And I am reading the Pathfinder rules, because Blake challenged me to run Pathfinder, since I keep busting on him about it being the superior system. And I'm like, there is just so much shit to remember in this game, you know? <laughs> and I like it. And, and again, I still would like to run even like a short game of it at some point in the future. I mean, I, that won't be soon. We're talking like probably next year, next summer, or next spring or something. I mean, I've got to really get through this game and run more of run more of my game. And then, then I'll consider a Pathfinder thing. I mean, who knows? Maybe I'll, you know, maybe over the winter I'll be like, all right, let's do a four-week stand at Pathfinder, but I think if I'm going to run something else, to any degree that requires effort, a lot of effort, and then your future is going to be the next tail scenario, which is what I'm going to, I'm just bringing the iPad with me when I go away. I'm not bringing my computer. I won't get a lot of rules writing done but I can at least use the iPad to take some notes and start thinking about the next Tales playtest which I mean I'm thinking I'm thinking a lot about it I have it in my mind I have kind of a whole environment and plot basic very basic plot but I of course want to evolve it and like I said to you the other day Tom I want to try to make it more social and political to test that end of it we did a lot of the travel a lot of the combat and that kind of stuff in the last one. For most challenges.
Yeah, it's three, it's three point five on steroids. It really is. Um, oh, good. Okay, cool. Yeah, I I would be like I said. I mean, we'll play whatever when we get together over Labor Day. We'll we'll play whatever. I'd love to play more Star Wars, though, quite honestly. Again, I we're playing D anD D already with Blake. That's awesome. Um, I really wouldn't. I really wouldn't mind playing more Star Wars. I really. I still. I really love the D six. I'm gonna get my Star Wars shirt on today. Full geek mode. Um, I. I'd still. I would really like to do more of that. She skyped Blake in on that. I think we had mentioned that being okay. See if he wants to come in and zoom in or Skype in on that. Because I know he's, you know, out of all of us, I don't know, you guys are kind of tied, but he might be the bigger Star Wars nut. And yeah, Blake, I was saying earlier that I... I've spent a lot of time trying to figure out this chat thing. <clears throat> I think it's just the way OBS works. I think if you don't have it as a one to two times a month online sessions. Yeah, I mean, again, I'm, I, you know, especially for the next year, I'm, <laughs> as far as I know, uh, another week and I, Diana's the only sticking point because of her work schedule. Um, and I know she really likes it and really would want to play. So we'd have to think about that. As of now, Tuesdays are all right for her because she doesn't go in early on Wednesday. And... But she, they, they do their music, their orchestra group on Tuesday nights. And they'll probably start that back up in the fall. So we'll, we'll have to talk about it. We'll have to see what works for everybody. But I, yeah, I'm game. Maybe if we just do once a month to start. And if we can maintain that, maybe try two nights. Which that's what I'm thinking of doing with my, with the in-person group. Because like I've, I've talked to Blake about it. And I think we talked a little bit about it with you, Tom. That that's gotten really fractured. And um, it's through no one's fault. It's just the way it is. People, people's lives have shifted a little bit in the last year. And in some cases, I think maybe their interests have shifted. And maybe they don't want to fully admit that. And that's okay. Um, just in terms of prioritizing it. And that's cool. Like, whatever, you know. But, you know, Andy, Andy was blunt. Andy was like, yeah, yep, yeah, exactly. You guys are busy with that. I'm busy with trying to keep this running. I am looking into starting some paid GM stuff, um, you know, and I got to really be prepared for that because if, you know, I'm charging people to run a game, I have to be really on top. So I, I intend to keep myself busy even if I'm not working full time, you know. We all know how that goes. I have less time during the day to myself when I'm home, <laughs> you know, than if I'm sitting in an office. So, but yeah, like as far as the in-person group, like Andy just said, like I need to take a break, and I'm like, yeah, that's cool. And like, so we've had trouble kind of coordinating a schedule more than like once a month anyway. So I'm thinking about just saying let's just do once a month. If we can't role play, if people aren't all there to role play, maybe just do board games. Just so that everybody kind of has it in there. Even Mel said that the other day. She's like, how about we just schedule, like... Now, my response to that is, like, if we're going to play a role-playing game, I'd really rather it be more than once a month. Because you forget everything. I mean, that's, that's what happened with Call of Cthulhu. We ran into that a little bit with Warhammer when we had, like, three weeks off coming back not really remembering what was going on. So, I'll, uh, you know, we'll talk about it with the group when, when we get back from Norway. Then we have about a month till we go to Germany, and that's that's a few weeks. But we could at least start, could at least start talking about with the various groups. Much less more than one attribute. I tried to give a lot more examples in the various sections for this game. Yeah, like I was reading on using like an iPad for um, keeping the keeping the stream active. I mean, it might it might still work for me because if I have that up on its own window on an iPad and I'm just doing chat on the iPad, it should still feed into into what OBS sees because OBS is pulling directly from Twitch. There's no intermediary, so 
I, I think it might still work. I don't know, I'll, have to, I'll experiment with it when I get back. Yeah, back to discussing discussing Pathfinder. Yeah, I mean, creating a character, especially because, at least as of now, they don't have something as integrated as D&D Beyond. I mean, when we did it for Tim's game, and that was just a weekend game, and he was like, oh, I want everyone to make two characters. I was like, no. No. <laughs> that That's going to take one whole day. <laughs> you know, like, like it's for, for a four-hour game, right? Yeah, I was like, no, absolutely not. I was like, let's just use pre-generated like kind of templates and modify them you know that's i was just like no, it's, i'm not gonna do that <laughs> it's just too much time even fifth ed with dnd beyond you could you could do a character in 20 minutes or whatever you know so yeah i mean if if we do a pathfinder game it'll you know, I'm going to make it substantial. Like, it's not going to be a one-shot. one, one shot. Like, I'm not going to put that work into the system, the environment, and having you guys make characters for, like, two hours, you know. I would have to... I would chart it out to be at least, you know, eight game sessions or something like that. Get a really solid... story in. And I'm actually thinking of it being a slightly different environment than I normally run a fantasy game in. Like it would be, it would be a fantasy game. It would be, it would be Pathfinder. But I was thinking of something, not quite Victorian. Maybe, maybe more like mid to late Renaissance era to allow for like the gunslingers and some of these other kind of weird, weird things that are in Pathfinder that don't, in my opinion, really fit a traditional D and D world or a traditional fantasy world, but could be interesting. So I don't know. Like I said, it's in my head. It's it's a ways out. It's not anything I'm going to prioritize. Once I get this done. The good thing about Tales is, as you know, like once you know the, the basics of the system, creating a character is actually fairly quick. You know, half hour, you can get a, you can get your character at least fleshed out. Which was my goal. You know, I, I didn't want it to be something that took this extreme amount of time. Oh, what would you guys say? It's rules medium in terms of rules light, heavy, and medium. Tales of the Hard Land. I don't think it's rules light. I think with 60 pages of gifts indicates that it's not rules light. But I don't think it's, you know, D&D &D or Pathfinder. Proofreading. You all can sit and watch me proofread. I don't know how exciting that is. Six, seven? Yeah, I, I guess I'd put it right about there, too. 
I mean, it's got enough rules, especially when I added some of the stuff that made it, made the requirement of it being a little more tactical in terms of having a, a map and all that. Because again, you remember the early versions, I my original vision was, you know, I don't even know if it's going to be totally theater of the mind's eye or what. But I, um, you know, it's a game, it is sword and sorcery. You do want that occasional epic battle where you, you know, fight off 30 foes or whatever, you know, per, per character and, you know, cut through swaths of foes and then fight the Lich King or whatever, you know, whatever you put in there. But it, it's, I didn't want it to be something that took hours. Like I said, I was watching one other streamer and he was talking about a a game where it, you know one like three turns took two and a half hours you know and I, I'm like there's really nothing fun to me about that at this point in my life <laughs> you know I, I I just and even Lauren was saying like the podcast and we did talk a little bit more about what went on with that and she she left she was you know I think she was just tired I think she just needed a break um, but one thing is, like, they had one battle that lasted, like, seven sessions or something like that. Like, one battle. And I'm like, wow. Like, I mean, if it's very narrative, I guess if it's very narrative, it could be interesting. And they had a lot of people. But I'm like, wow. I mean, my goal is to make combat interesting and make it important. And most of all, keep it moving. And like I said, I didn't listen to it, so I don't know. I don't know how it flowed. But that's just so long. To resolve one one situation, but some players that's their thing, you know. something up.
was an interesting discussion last night. People uh, brought up a couple of the difficult topics when I when I referenced this being a quasi historical game. And, and rooted in real world cultures, and I think it was Bobacus or somebody else brought up, brought up slavery. You know how do I, how are you going to handle that? And I said, well, it's it's a reality in the game. You know, one of my students was on who is uh, inter interesting. His his opinion, his his viewpoint is interesting because a lot of things that like we I thought it would be taken for granted. Like, this might be offensive or not offensive. He had different viewpoints on. And not in a bad way, just just different. And he was questioning, like, okay, well, why wouldn't you use this instead of this? And, you know, and I understand this is also coming up, you know, from our ancient level of experience here. That part of it is how you phrase something. Like, you can handle any topic in these games, you know, within reason. That makes sense for the game. But how you phrase it is a very different thing, you know? And... And like we were discussing this idea of primitive culture and, you know, enlightened culture. And I brought up like the golden bow and stuff like that, where it's the language used to describe this other culture that is, which we know from today's world, right? I mean, you could, you, you could say the same thing about a, a, a group of people and say it three different ways. And it means entirely different things. Um, and, you know, that's the nuances of that are one thing that I think a lot of people have lost and part of the reason why we are where we are culturally. But it was an interesting conversation. I didn't expect this discussion on cultural creation to go into this route of, you know, possible controversial elements and topics, including things like gender identity and stuff like that, which I do talk about in this game. But, you know, like we said to him, if, if you describe a culture as primitive, if you describe a culture a primitive in terms of technology, and then you also say that they're inferior to the guys who live in a city, you know, this other, this other culture that lives in a city, and, you know, they're less important, which in colonial world, that's how it's defined, that's wrong, right? But simply describing a culture as more primitive or less technological isn't necessarily bad, especially if you're basing it on some historical paradigm. Like there's the obvious references of some of the cultures I have here to, to indigenous cultures around the world, the Melek and the Fror in particular. They're still more or less, except for those that have moved into towns, they're still more or less at, a, at an indigenous person level. And of course, you know, the, the, the cultures that, that live in these cities that have been around for, in one case, 3,000 years, of course they consider them the savages that live out on the plain. I mean, that's, yeah, of course. I'm not going to deny there's not prejudice in, in these cultures, in these cultures, in stereotyping in these cultures. But this, I think, speaks to author point of view versus character viewpoint. And again, I've also noticed some people have, no matter what they say, they have trouble separating that. We discussed Tecumel a little bit last night, too. The, the game that exalted these, you know, primitive indigenous people, but then you find out the writer was this screaming anti-Semite and bigot and, you know, anything that was Africanized or Semitic was, you know, basically in his mind evil and you're just like, you know, but these these other cultures, these kind of Asiatic tribe cultures and these South American tribe cultures, he kind of created this whole fantasy around them. But that feeds into that whole Atlantean, you know, uh, that whole that whole myth that was popular popularized through Blavatsky and all those those occultists that you know had this fantasy version of. Of you know Nordic people living in the Himalayas, you know the enlightened masters, versus everybody else who was you know or the the Celts, the ancient Celts were these enlightened, enlightened Euro Eurocentric culture. Which in reality we know, of course, the Celts the Celts did not the Celts yeah the Celts do the Celts probably originated from a an Indo culture. You know they 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 may have looked very different than we think they did. In modern day, when people say Celtic today, they're talking about modern Irish and Scottish, and that's actually post-Roman. 
the original Celts probably did not look anything like like we like the traditional vision of the Celts. You know, Braveheart didn't represent Celts at all. It had nothing to do with Celts. Neil's Celtic. Blake's Celtic. Tom probably is too. I, you know, well, you know, and again, I think this goes into what we discussed a little bit last night. There's also a way to frame it and time and a place for it. The only, the closest we ever had was, was I think our, our one friend, RC, who we, who we joke about, which, which by the way, RC was also not, not white. Um, he's Latino. And, but he played as former Civil War soldier in a vampire game, a Civil War captain in a vampire game. That was still like, horrendously bigoted and still thought the South was going to rise again and still was fine with slavery, you know, again. But he was, it was also almost a parody of that mindset. When I mean, we lived in urban North Jersey, you know, it, 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 he, at, at the time, well, some of us lived in South or Central, but he lived in or, urban North Jersey and, you know, was, grew up in this urban and mixed, mixed ethnicity household and, this urban environment. So him playing it, I mean, again, he said a lot of things just to get reactions and just to, you know, yeah, and we were also all like, you know, pretty young too. So of course he was saying things that were inflammatory just to be that guy. But, um, let's see. Okay. And, you know, so again, we took it, we took it because we knew who RC was. If I sat down at a convention and there was, and I had a guy in a war play play a vampire character like that too except he was questionable because i think he was i think he was pretty much expressing things he believed through his character and that got a little weird and he never got invited back um especially because again it was in an area where it was a very mixed culture game i mean it wasn't you know it was up in, it was outside of new york city it wasn't it wasn't like you were dealing with a bunch of players who never who were all the same ethnicity so and this is years ago. I have no trouble playing NPCs who are like this. And in fact, even in the Old West game, some of my regular players were shocked at how blatantly racist some of my NPCs were. I'm like, well, it's the Old West. It's just after the Civil War. Like, you know, these people aren't going to be nice to certain people, <laughs> just on general principle. And we did have, uh, you know, an African... African rooted character in the in the game. We did have a Native American character in the game and they did encounter prejudice. And that's I'm like, well, unfortunately, that's that was the climate of that time period, whether we want to admit it now or not. But that's as a game master. That's as presenting characters that are possible antagonists or obstacles. And I think it really depends on the group. Like, if I played a character like that with my regular in-person group, or with some of the people who are on now who've known me for decades, um, in some cases, and know that my current viewpoints, you know, my viewpoints, my, my viewpoints have never been that outlandish at all, 
but especially in the modern context, you know, I I give no zero tolerance to that kind of that kind of bigotry in day to day interaction. And I've cut friends, former friends, out of my life who I was friends with for a good long time because they adopted attitudes that were completely bigoted. You know, and I teach I teach college and I teach in a very multicultural school, a very progressive school. I have students and colleagues of all different backgrounds. And like, why would I, you know, why would I promote something that was that detrimental to them? You know, that's just not my, you know, not my thing. I, and I don't get it. And I occasionally still see it on certain gaming boards with people who are basically generationally in my group, you know, mostly white guys in their 40s to 50s who make comments and they just don't even know why making that comment is a problem. And I'm like, <laughs> come on, it's not 1980 anymore. It wasn't right in 1980, you know. But again, if you grew up in a certain environment, like I did in certain, and some friends of mine did, prejudice was just a daily thing, you know, but you grow, <laughs> you get out of it, you, 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 you know, you, you, you realize that those attitudes are not healthy and they're not normal and they're not, you know, they're manufactured. It's like when I talked about gender identity last night, that's, that's gender identity and racial identity are social constructs. They don't, they're not real. They're created by people who want to impose a vision onto other people. Like fighters, fencers, weavers, jewelers, archers, escape artists, pickpockets. I guess I'll include stage magicians. So there's no there's no confusion between, you know, in a world like this, between a magician and a magician. Yeah, that actually looked pretty good. I'm still up in the air if I'm going to stream any prep sessions for actual RPG content because I I saw someone doing that the other day and it was he's doing a really good job of it. It was interesting, but I'm like, what if your players are watching? How close microphone action of seltzer water being poured? Yeah. Yeah, temporarily block them from the stream. Then I won't, then I won't have any viewers, right? Because nine, nine times out of ten, it's people who I play with regularly who end up popping on to view. Oh, sorry, I got blocked from the stream today. It'll just be me, me streaming. I think this will all... I mean, it's already... I mean, every every week I get a couple new followers and I, I get more watches and it's definitely picking up. I think once the game's out there and I start doing things with it publicly it'll this will definitely increment accordingly which is fine again i'd rather do it the way i want to do it and attract people who are really interested rather than you know make it something i'm not really about just to get ratings beyond, beyond that
control of themselves. More importantly, how to subtly overtly manipulate others. I wonder if it wouldn't be an interesting challenge to try to make, like, movie characters with this system and see how they stack up, like Darth Vader. Because I was just thinking, like, what would Darth Vader's presence be on a scale of 1 to 10? Probably, probably pretty high. Probably 8 to 10. His mind might be 5 to 7. I mean, he's smart, but he's not, you know... Finesse is not quite as high, especially not in that bio suit. But his defense rating is more than made up for by his armor. His body is probably pretty high. Presence. Kind of glad that one thing 5e did in terms of the magic users is, let's see. Well, <laughs> occasionally I've seen Florida comes down to it. What would that be? Um, they blow up when their beliefs are threatened. Huh, interesting. My characters are really varied. I mean, I, I, I've i been doing this so long that, like I've said to quite a few people, and I've said to some of my other streams, I'm at the point, like, I don't have the emotional attachment to characters at this point. Or the role-playing experience, to me, it's more of an intellectual exercise. And I say, so I'm even willing to say, so why don't you just hand me a, hand me a character if you, if you have something you want played. Um, but if not, I mean, I try to keep my characters fairly varied. You know, like in Warhammer, when I play Lord Manhammer, he's, he's basically a moron. He's, he's a religious zealot. He's a warrior priest. He's not a bad guy. He's a nice guy, but he's... He is single-minded. And there's no challenge against beliefs because his beliefs are always right. He's actually the guy who I don't like in real life. He's like actually the guy that in real life that really bothers me because no matter what you say to him, in his mind it's already this way and this is how it's going to be. And he, it's right. And he follows that agenda. You know, except maybe when one of his friends can convince him otherwise... Whereas the vampire character I'm currently playing is, well, he's a Malkavian, so he's psychotic. But um, he comes off as extremely social. People would think he was a Toreador. He's really normal. Definitely gender fluid in the modern context. And there is this sense of, you know, he's kind of this fun guy. But last, they saw him melt down. They saw his derangement kick in last last game. And one of the players was actually very disturbed. And it wasn't violent. It wasn't perverse. I just switched so quickly to this other character and this other mindset. I, I one of my player, one of my players, co-players and friends. I think she was actually a little disturbed by this, and I was like, "Well, that's being deranged." Is oh yeah, Carl is like totally. You're you, Carl is the opposite of you in real life. Carl the witch hunter, the psychotic. Or the deviant, not deviant, it's like a single, who's an inquisitor? He's modeled off an historical inquisitor. You know, they're, 
They were horrible people. They were non empathetic. They were, you know, they did anything they could do to get their to get their fanatic belief in place. And of course, he and Manhammer just feed off each other, and it's just like. Every game I'm like, we're going to end up just like torturing and burning down this entire town because we suspect somebody might be a witch, you know. I think we've only done that once or twice. Blow up. So do you think that's you or do you think that's your characters? And that's always an interesting discussion. Like I said, these days my characters are less and less like me in real life, but... There's still, there's still always a little bit, though, right? I mean, even in your strangest characters... Well, except maybe Carl. Carl and Tom. Having spent a lot of time with Tom, I can assure you, he and, he and Carl are not at all alike. Manhammer and I both like beer, so we're kind of... We're, kinda, we're, we're, we're on that page. I hate artificial caps, but I think I'm going to have to cap it that beginning heroes only ha can only have one 10. Because 10 is superhuman in this game. I mean, that's like, you know, right? if you want to say real world examples, uh, you know, half Thor Bjornsson, the weightlifter, is, you know, he's a 10 strength because he's doing like these literally superhuman things. Like, the average person can't even understand how he does it. And then, or it's... Stephen Hawking is a 10 intelligence. It's this, this level of brain power and functionality on a different plane that even if you consider yourself smart, you listen to this guy talk or you read what he's written and you're just like, wow, he theorized this and it's right. <laughs> you know, it, it's not even working through the process and it is working through a process. I have a max of 10 and you want a troop. Because you could, in theory, have two 10s and 2s and other things. That would be kind of ridiculous, but you, you could do it. The one thing I am going to put in here, and I think, I think Blake and Tom can agree, is I am going to have a character building. I mean, there are going to be examples of somebody building a character. I'll see. Well, I mean, that's a pretty human trait too, though, right? Like, if you have the power to punish somebody who's offended you, you know, and it's in your personality to do so, most, most people will, you know, if that's, the, if that's their core motivation. I don't know. I mean, I, I get pretty... If I think someone's threatened me in some fashion, I get pretty, I get pretty hostile. That's that's kind of a trigger, a hair trigger for me too. And again, sometimes it is a misunderstanding, right? I mean, but in addition to the example of a person building a character, I'm actually going to have a character, you know, kind of a tips on allotting points because you know if we saw it last time. A bunch of fours and fives in this game are not necessarily are not necessarily an effective way to build a character. And again, people can do whatever they want to make it conceptual, but this game really works better if you have at least one skill that's high. Or one or two of your core skills are extremely high that you can actually succeed in. Versus, oh, I have this cool collection of jack-of-all-trades stuff, but that makes sense in terms of the delineations, but it's, it's kind of doesn't work system wise. And again, that's a case where does the system have a slight disconnect? 
it is a heroic game. The assumption is the heroes, the characters, the player characters will probably, in general, start to be start being really good at something. One thing. I mean, it's kind of the same with stuff like like Call of Cthulhu too. I tell people that like having a bunch of skills at thirty percent don't does not make any sense in terms of the game mechanics. Having one skill at an eighty and a couple at sixty to seventy, and then some miscellaneous skills are fine, but. If your character's a detective saying, well, I think he only has a 40% investigation. Probably isn't going to get much done. All right. Now to write up the character concept building. Interesting thing, like we always have this vision of gladiatorial fights to the death, and I was watching a fairly well-researched uh, documentary on, on gladiatorial fighting, and, and the fact is 90% of battles between gladiators were non-lethal because they were money-making celebrities, right? I mean, they, especially if they were owned by somebody or sponsored by, you know, a noble or even if they were a free person, they made all their money in the pit. And if you kill off your best characters, people stop watching the show. Now, unfortunately, a lot of slaves were killed and a lot of, you know, a lot of animals were killed in these fights with these gladiators. But as almost sacrifices to them. But as a rule, the gladiators rarely were pitted in fights to the death against each other. So this is all a five, and so we need to add.
is a good reevaluation. You know, 22 points, a little low. Might be a little bit low. Two average, one slightly above, slightly below average, or low on the low average side, and then one definitely higher than average, but not superhuman. That's probably a good baseline. You can raise this stuff later, it's just really expensive. I guess I guess that's a pretty rounded character. Because as we've seen, to get a minimum success, you don't need a lot of dice. You know, three to four dice, you can get a minimum success on average tasks. It's when you're trying to do something or get a lot of success, you need a lot more dice. Really interesting. I, I feel like I started you guys with a little bit more in terms of attribute points. I don't know if Tom and Blake are are on, I don't know if they even remember, but 20, 22 points is what I have here, and I think that's what I gave you. For some reason, I thought you guys had a little bit higher attributes to start. I don't remember if I bumped it up or if it's just erased it throughout the game. I could take the approach to start a little bit on the lower end, and then if, as a rule, players seem to feel like their characters aren't tough enough out of the gates, I mean, they're still way above average people now. In at least one thing. All right, did I start? Did I start them all at a one? I think I started them all at a one. That's that's right. That's why it looks different. <laughs> See, this is why I'm doing this and chatting with people about it and going back through. Let me see if I included that in. That's that's what it was. That's why everybody had like a little bit of an edge. Because everybody started with a one. Thanks, Tom. I thought it was 22. I was like, I think, it's, I, th I think it started with 22 last time and we decided it was pretty good. Why does it look low? And that would be why. I guess I'll write that in. That was it. Did the bottom I talk about that? Yeah, here we go. Move that down there.
be it. Okay. Yeah, I think that's what we did. And this allows for a little bit more play in terms of totals.
Take a quick break. We'll be right back. All right.
now we move on to the traits. Kind of tightened up the attributes, which are your core stats, and traits are derived from your attributes, and they affect the game in other ways. Scores above 10, except that then it is a note, though it should be obvious. Obviously, certain creatures that are, even humans or creatures that are way above the norm, can have higher than 10. Points. Action points are the core. That's something we found out. So much so that players lobbied me to create a system which you could buy more action points later above and beyond your base finesse score. Because they're kind of the core of the system in terms of how many things you can do per turn. And it was clear that characters with really high action points would always dominate everything. And as heroes, we put in an advancement system where you could buy some extra Buy some extra points. Boy, this light's really making my face look red today. It makes everything look red, especially my face. Throw a little fluorescent from the other side. I got got white balanced lights in the other room. I think one of my goals after I get back is going to be to set up an area and the hopefully then refinished or at least water weatherproofed unfinished basement to to do streaming and with a backdrop and all that because it's a little bit more climate controlled than the garage and it will be more so than more so once it's refinished and i could at least set up a corner there where everything is you know lighting's controlled and all that I mean, I've seen people streaming in their pajamas from their bathroom, you know, so I know I know that there's a, a vast spread of what people what people expect and what people do, but I'd like to get my visuals a little bit more tightened up now that this seems to be a thing.
I also decided to write up front, give a give the actions action point costs right in this section of some basic stuff. So, you know, if you said all oh, my characters pretty much just gonna be sitting around and talking to people and writing books, I can get away with two action points a turn. I don't have to worry about it. But yet, yeah, if you're playing like a heavy fighter character or a really active scout type character or dexterity based character, then obviously you want more. Do I misspell pauldron? Or does it just not know what a pauldron is? Let's see. Might not know what a pauldron is. It just doesn't know what a pauldron is. Actually, it shouldn't be a, probably put on a breastplate would be three action points. Thanks to the Mandalorian, Wendell. Thanks to the Mandalorian, no one. I was kind of surprised they didn't have Pauldron in a spelling list. How are you today, Wendell? Yeah, it was an interesting chat last night. Like I said, I realized it was pretty unidirectional. I was like, huh. I guess I, I guess I, just as a writer, write a lot more about this stuff than most people because it was pretty much people listening to me talk about what I do, which is unusual. It was less the back and forth than the normal Wednesday night chat, which is okay too. So defense rating, for it to strike the character, potentially damage them.
Doing okay. Doing the last stream for about a week and a half. Maybe, maybe almost two full weeks, depending on how things go. I've gotten so into a rhythm with writing this stuff and working on this stuff that not doing it is going to be stressful for me. I think that's the hazard of deciding you're going to do all this stuff for yourself on your own. Same thing with my music practice. I've really gotten this progression and this rhythm going with it and I'm building myself up and now like, oh wait, I can't do it for a week and a half. And that's stressing me out a little bit, which I guess that's the transition between I'm doing this in my spare time for the fun of it and I'm going to make this a thing. You know, but I, I think getting away after almost three years of not getting away will be healthy, too. You know, assuming I don't get COVID on the plane or whatever. Or we're not stuck at we're not stuck at some strange airport for three days while uh, SAS sorts out a problem, which is actually my bigger source of stress right now. They've already done something with our reservation. I got an email about this morning I'm not happy with. I mean, it's not catastrophic, but it's just annoying. Again, I'm just I'm like, man. Then again, it was an extremely cheap flight. <laughs> so I guess when you get an extremely cheap flight, this is, this is one of the risks. Especially from an airline that's been having all kinds of problems this summer. The fact they're still flying amazes me. I was sure in mid-July we were not going to have a trip because they were going to fold and it would be too expensive to rebook on another airline this soon. So I guess we're going to find out. See how things go. Health levels. Um, I think it was really interesting. Yeah, I was talking earlier. So one of my students is on and he had some really interesting questions that I kind of didn't expect from this particular student about why I'd make certain choices or not make certain choices or what the problem was with portraying certain historical things in a certain fashion. And again, I, I'm not going to, you know, I, I know a bit about the student personally. So that's why I thought these were interesting and I was I'm not going to divulge, you know, details or anything but it was it was enlightening to me and i think i talked about you a little bit talked with this with you a little bit about this on messenger earlier it's always interesting to me when i realize oh so most people kind of really don't consider these things you know and they're the kind of things i would have thought maybe a a 20 something from that particular region that particular demographic would have cons would have thought about in this context but then again, I think about, you know, the D&D &D games Blake and I played when we were 20. So, so again, I, I, I think I'm looking through this after 30 years of more experience of, you know, of how to manage certain things. But it was an interesting chat. We talked about, as I discussed earlier, we talked about some rough stuff. We talked about slavery and basically prejudice in these games and how to, how to deal with concepts like that. 
because you can't you can't just pretend it never happens, especially in a game like this that is a little more a little more uh, it's more of an emerging cultures game. You know, there's no even illusion of a sense of an of an age of enlightenment. We all we know the age of enlightenment really just really did not enlighten everybody. We know that that's kind of a misnomer. Much like the Dark Ages is a misnomer. Um, yeah, it was interesting. It was it was different than I thought it was going to be. I, you know, and I and again, like um, Wolfie shared some stuff that another mutual acquaintance of ours who I've gamed with some work he did on making elves a little more unique in his world. And that was kind of cool. It's kind of interesting to look to look at where someone else had taken kind of a standard fantasy race and developed them a little bit, given them unique culture. But like, you know, yeah, I, I will revisit it again at some point. And maybe when I revisit it, it'll be the point where I maybe we'll have a broader base of people chiming in and and it might be something that I might exempt. So I've already talked to a couple people who are on board of pulling in some personalities from the game world, the gaming world. Nobody big. I mean, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not, I don't have, I don't have plans to have, you know, uh, any celebrity game writers on here. But people I know who have done a lot of work in gaming culture of various kinds, not necessarily gaming, but surrounded to gaming culture to come on and talk a little bit with me at some point and chat about stuff. And I've already gotten a confirm and it'd be interesting maybe to get somebody who writes stuff from a multicultural perspective to come on and talk about that again. You know, like why something as simple as, and this is the example I use when I monitor game jams and I act as a referee or you know, moderator or whatever mentor for game jams. Like when a student tells me this particular warrior from this place has this type of axe, well, why do they have that type of axe? Because it looks cool, and that's fine. Sometimes an axe looks cool, right? But there's a reason why axes looked a certain way from certain parts of the world. And I, and I don't think it's necessary to write a thesis every time you design a character or a culture, but I think it helps to think about these things. And that's kind of what the thrust of the talk was. This time of year is rough. Like, I know several people who, who normally are much more active on the stream were actually away this week, and I'll be away next week. And a couple other people had other reasons that they, they couldn't make it. So I was actually hoping it would be a little bit livelier. But it was live, it was much, it was, it was more interactive than the problem players were. And like I said, it was weird. The problem player stream, I think, I think some people are uncomfortable addressing it. Because sometimes either they are the problem, and when I say problem player, again, that's I'm not saying they're the problem. That there's a reason why they have trouble integrating into a group, or that people that they play with are those people that have trouble integrating with a group and and stress out the rest of the group. So again, and I and that's not accusatory. Yeah, and, and you know, and this is what I say all the time, like, same thing with character backstories. You don't necessarily need to have this huge depth and huge level of detail that the players will never encounter. But even if it's there in your mind, and you weave it into your descriptions, and you weave it into your stories, I think it does something different. I think it creates something that is more memorable to the player.
I think it's I think it's a shortcut, and I think it's a short changing yourself if you're going to invest in a long term world or campaign, and you don't do that little bit of work in cultural development. Right, it's a value, and and this I've had this talk with. And I won't drop names, but some really well-known musicians in the more conceptual pagan ritually music world. Uh, people who like learn go learn how to make all of their own drums. You could probably figure out who I'm talking about. Um, you know, and you say to him, "Well, that's cool, but can't you just go buy a drum? Wouldn't that be a lot easier than having to go like skin a goat yourself?" And he's like, "Well." But I know the difference. And when I know the difference, the end result of what I do is different. It has a different, it is different. And this was touched on, you know, and I hate to bring up Crowley because, because, yeah, you got to skin that goat. Um, you know, you bring up Crowley and of course he was an awful human being by today's standards. But his whole discussion of making your own ritual knife, right? Like, like. It doesn't matter, but you made it, right? It's it's this it's this bringing forth something of yourself and putting in that little bit of extra detail that matters. And even if it only matters to you, that will show to somebody else. You know, that will show through to somebody else. So that's kind of how I approach world building. And like I said, yeah, don't get me wrong. A lot of my D&D games, even with my current regular group, are very beer and pretzels. I'll, but it's still, even the city of Neil Draw, where I'm running the current game, I wrote probably another 20 pages of details into unique things about Neil Draw and former pieces of architecture that can be found and some interaction between um, the, the, you know, the, the, the royal guards and the, the political structure at large. Thanks. Yeah, I think a lot. Going going back to what we said earlier, I think sometimes I think way too much about this stuff. But then I say no. It's you know, it does have a difference when you have that level of preparation and depth. It, there is a difference in the game or or whatever, whatever creative outlet you are pursuing. That little bit of extra work for detail and depth does come through, and it's. It's fine because I know a lot of people, for example, pick up and run a pre-made setting or a pre mouse because they don't have the time. They're not writers. They're not skilled in, in the research. I get that. And that's great. But from the perspective I'm coming from, and especially from, say, a game like this where there's the starting cultures are all human. There is no broad existence of non-human, demi-human things that you could play or interact with. The cultures have to be unique. The cultures have to have depth. But then as I extended last night, okay, then why are all why are all elves basically the same in a lot of fantasy literature? And I know that's changed. I know, especially with later editions of games, this has really changed. I mean, some of the best were like the I think it was was it RuneQuest? The RuneQuest elves. Yeah. Exactly. Well, that's and that's why I like historical games like Call of Cthulhu or Vampire, where you can have a character that's lived for six hundred years. This idea of researching this is what's really interesting to me. to corruption, essence and corruption. So there's power. It's initiative rating. It's pretty straightforward. I actually use definitions. Initiative action. I'm proud of myself. Using consistent large words throughout the entire document. Instead of just kind of making it up as I go and then going back and realizing I had no idea what I was talking about. Which was, when I reread a lot of this, I was like, yeah, you were just writing this as you thought of it. So 
Stop using words like usually, commit to a plan. I mean, I think my strength is in creating these really deep environments and, and descriptive environments and deep kind of backdrops. I think my flaw is believable NPCs. And I think I have memorable NPCs, but I know people who do it far more successfully than I do. And I've even watched a couple streams where people pull out these NPCs and they, they really, they're so lifelike and they're so multifaceted. And I'm like, wow, you know, that's, a, that's amazing. <laughs> you know, that's, that's a skill I wish I could, I could tap more easily. But I found that when I was writing fiction too, that my real interest is in environment and description. And I, I think that's why I'm drawn to RPGs. Because you know, the players, the players are the main characters. So that's their job, is to create the main characters to move around this world and environment. Defend against magic, not defend magic. The challenge rating, which must be overcome on a target. When targeted by something, okay. Divided by two. Okay. Corruption is powerful force in this one. Raise the chance of success. Yeah, I guess that's the way to word it. Maybe I'll parenthesize it. Parenthesize? Is that a word? Am I officially a, a game writer now? I think I just made up a verb. Parenthesize. That's kind of interesting there, Bob. Because something the DM was, yeah, yeah. So that would be a way for the give the player the DM some agency in the pro in the social system as well. It almost sounds like some of the early MMO criminal flags, right? I know Blake will know what I'm talking about. You kill enough people, you go red, or commit enough crimes, you go red, and no one can deal with you. Young people today will never know the thrill the first time you logged into Ultima Online. Ultimate PK! Ultima PK! Who was it? Alice Cooper was the guy. That was his character name on our server. It was, it was horrible. When you saw him coming, you just cringed. Him and like 20, 20 other red characters. That was, that was some of the best MMO. I think like in my whole experience with MMOs just went downhill from that because I never really got into any of the others. It was just, it was such an experience because it was so new. I mean, again, we always dreamed, imagine if you could just go online and play, yeah, brown eyes. Yeah, that's right, brown eyes. Imagine if you could just go on line and play D&D &D, basically or whatever, you know. And again, at that time, it was brand new. What, 1994 or something? Was it that early? 95? I mean, I think I was, uh, maybe a little bit later, maybe 97 or so. So I was, at, I was down in South Jersey still when I, when I, when that 
came about. Of course, the Koreans had already been doing it in 98. Yeah, that's about right. The Koreans had already been doing it for like, you know, five years or something. But more sophisticated games. And of course, there were all the old light like, talkers and muds and stuff like that. But this was like, oh my god, I can make a character and step into this world. Run around as a little pixel. Pixel guy. No, they were more advanced than that, but... Hey, it's Peach. What's going on, man? Oh, cool. Wow, oh, that's good. Yeah, so no, sometimes you gotta... Sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do. Yeah, I was saying last night was interesting. It was a little less animated than normal, but it was it was an interesting set of discussions. It's all, it's all online. You can go check it out or check it on YouTube or... Any combination thereof it'll be on this for another week or so but no I'm glad at least you were doing something that was good that was energetic and fun I'll probably be on here a little bit longer today all right yeah so tell us about it what were you what were you working on like I was saying to uh, Wendell I'll, I'll probably revisit that a little bit later on in the year so so full confession I really hate the Harley Quinn character I hate everything about it and I have zero interest um, there are others I might be more interested in and I'm not a big animated series person either and I've really just had to realize that, which is ironic considering one of the teach things I teach is 2D animation. But I'm not a big I'm not a big animated person. Animated genre person. Yeah, we've had this discussion, but like. Um just I really dislike the character. I, and I always have, and I I tried watching the recent Suicide Squad movie, and I just I really hated it. <laughs> I really hated. I really didn't like most of it, but I really hated Harley Quinn, and I'm just like, I can't get past it. Sorry. Oh, it depends, PJ. I could still be there. I don't know. I I, I don't know if Andy's watching. I don't know. I might have to disown him because of his opinions on on Obi Wan. I don't know if he's one of the people lurking. He sometimes lurks when he works at home. I told him that. I'm like, that's it. We can't be friends. No more. But he's in a, he's in a place with pretty much all the Marvel and Star Wars Disney stuff. He just is not satisfied with the way it's panned out. Whereas I think at least as far as the Star Wars, uh, you know, Book of Boba Fett excluded, I think it's some of the better stuff that we've seen in a very long time. I, 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 I really was not even interested in Obi-Wan. I was so down on the idea of it, and I watched the first episode, I was like, oh man, this is actually, like, pretty good, you know? And it ended up being actually, I think, maybe my favorite of the new, new Star Wars series. I just, I was so, like, we don't need to revisit Obi-Wan. Like, we can't make something new. One continent thing. Yeah, that's, yeah. Cool. Well, and I think that's... So I think that's what we have to understand. And I, I didn't even quite get this... I mean, I went through my process of developing the Meluk culture last night. Who are plainsmen... Plains, not plains people. They're a horse culture. And then my one student was like, like, are they... Do they ride horses or are they half horse and half human? I'm like, no, but they could be the origin of the centaur. And we could get into all the jokes about that. Um, but we won't. Not here. Not now. Um, but that's one thing I was trying to impress. And I, and I kind of didn't even get there last night. Like I said, it was kind of a weird chat. I mentioned last week. Desperate wants to play an Eldrin light cleric in a culture where there are neither elves, Eldrin duties. Right. Right. So, yeah, this, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, bad you couldn't come on last night because this was the kind of thing I was looking to go back and forth with. But we'll revisit it. We'll revisit it in the future. Maybe we'll plan it. And like I was saying, I might get try to get, uh, there are a couple people I know who do a lot of writing in this territory and I might try to get some of them to come on. 
But um, we also tend to forget how non-homogenous, forget our modern American culture is. Like, I think most of us are from the Northeast. Yeah, hopefully. No, well, PJ, I'm going to be in Germany at your at the time of your party. I thought I, I sent you an email. I don't know if you saw it or a text, but I'm actually going to be I'm actually going to be in Germany. Yeah, PNW Pacific Northwest. Okay, um, you know if you go from New York City even down to Delaware, the culture is very different. Very different. Forget. If you go, you would you like to? Well, I'm going to be at Midgard's Bullet Metal Festival next week. That's what you probably, in Norway, that's probably what you'd really like to go to. Um, I'm actually, I'm actually going, in Germany's going to be mostly a family visit. And maybe we'll get to some stuff, but there aren't many festivals going on around that time. They all happen a couple weeks earlier, but that's okay. Because I'm also going to go be meeting my, my bagpipe instructor and a number of other people. Well, where you are, so I had this discussion with um, my friend Alyssa, who actually is one of the people who might come on. She's a musician and a gamer, and she's been doing this a very long time. Uh, she has some unique perspectives on stuff, of course, also being, you know, being a woman, being being female presenting in this game culture. Oh, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I had that conversation with multiple people living in semi-rural PA. You know, to me, it was never even a question. <laughs> you know, it was like when you drive around and there was all nothing but the giant Trump banners. I'm like, well, of course he's going to win. Look at this. You know, I mean, all these people in these very kind of insulated environments had just convinced themselves that, oh, who likes that guy? I even had students in, in North Jersey, central North Jersey, be like, who voted for him? I'm like, let me take you Let me take you around my neighborhood. Let me take you an hour west of my neighborhood. And, and it's a whole different world. But so now think about a culture in... The Middle Ages, forget the difference between England and Armenia. Let's look at different towns even in England at that time. Composed of people who sometimes never went further than five miles from their house. Yeah, Sussex County, yeah, that, exactly. Hundred in. Hundred in is the same way. Now, a lot of those family farms are rich, too. Um, yeah, this is... Yeah, all right. We're, 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 we'll have to revisit this. We'll have to revisit this. Yeah, you, yeah I know. I was disappointed because I, I was like, oh, cool, BJ's party. I'm like, yeah, I don't... I'm not... You know, I'm not working. I should be able to... to well, not, not working full-time, not committed to a schedule. I should be able to get up there. Then I looked at the date, and that's when we had booked the Germany trip. I was like, oh, okay. Well, I mean, you... So, you know... There's a family, the family house in Germany, the, the, um, her, her uncle, who's a very hospitable, very cool dude, has always said, if you ever have friends that want to come over while you're here and, you know, see a little bit of, see a little bit of the country, you're welcome to it. Uh, so we could talk about that too. At some point. So if I look at a map right now. You know, so Armenia budded right up against the Abbasid Caliphate in in the Middle Ages and is not far from modern day Iran and, and the Byzantine Empire. You wanna talk about how different people were within maybe a difference of ten miles. They couldn't even talk to each other in some cases. You know, so Again, I think fantasy gaming has has let us in for ease, for convenience. And our vision of fantasy, let's say where Middle Earth is this largely mono European based monoculture, which is one of the extensive criticisms of the world, but it was written as a mythology for the British Isles. It was written as an Anglo Saxon mythology. Uh yeah, so you know. I've been going to European music festivals now for well over 20 years. I think I've seen one fight at all of them. 
And one was kind of their equivalent of a renaissance fair. And the people that were there that started the fight were clearly not like they were like, well, you know, what we call the walk in jerk offs. Right. Like at, at events like this here where they just come in to cause a problem, you know, I'm um, going to get drunk for the day and start a fight. Um, I'm, I won't do walk in. Too many people. Too many people. Think of the bathroom lines, man. She wants she's she Hellfest is more manageable. Hellfest is actually something I would go to. We were going to go to Summer Breeze a few years ago because it's 45 minutes from her family's house. So we could, if we had to, like camp one night and then go home. <laughs> you know? It's, it's, Vakken is just, it's amazing, but I'm just like, no. Here's when I'll go to Vakken. When I hook up with somebody over there that I can either get a backstage pass because I, so I could have my own bathroom and beer, you know? Or, or that I, you know, if I ever actually got to the point of playing with somebody who was that that big but probably not in my lifetime so um but yeah if i were in walking as a support role or as a guest i would i would go in fact the, the one band i do know over there corvus corax a couple of years ago the one guy was like oh if you want to go to walking let us know and i mean it was like a week away like we hadn't made plans to stay through walking but i think he probably would have given us a, you know at least a backstage pass so that we could at least you know do that because he's done that for other shows smaller shows over there so, um, yeah, I like that's the condition in which I might go to that. Hellfest is more manageable. I almost did Hellfest. Summer Breeze, yeah, exactly. Exact. Summer Breeze, Summer Breeze was, was, is a possibility. This year we're doing Midgard's Blood, though. That's, it's going to be very special. There's a lot of really cool things going on there, and it's on the Bore Viking Mounds. Um, near, on the same site as the Bore Viking Mound, the, the burial mounds. The historic ship find and all these other things and it's very special and the people that attend it are different i mean there's a lot of you know metalheads who show up and they're just there to party or whatever but everybody there has a the the, the festival uh, uh, promotes a different culture than a lot of the other big festivals over there and it's all outdoors and it's actually fairly small in number i don't know the exact ticket number sold this year but it's not not even ten thousand. I think it's much less than that, or you know. So it's it's a very different kind of event, and I really and I've really liked it in the past. Who knows? I've changed in the past two years. I might be there two days and be ready to go home. But we also know a lot of people that go to it, both both from Europe and and from even from here. So. Yeah, well, names like Freya and Thor are common there still. I have a whole Thor story from the last time we went. It was just it was very strange. Whole series of these Thor-like apparitions in the environment on the way into Bore. And then we go to the bar in Horton, and there's this guy who pulls up the seat next to us, and he's like, oh, hello, you know. Oh, how are you? What's your name? Oh, you probably won't believe me, but my name is Thor. And we were like, nah, we believe it. We just stepped in an American Gods episode, you know. It was very strange. The whole The whole trip was was very strange and then to have this guy buy me a drink have thor buy me a drink at the bar i was just like wow this is a bizarre day so but it's a cool it's a cool event oh okay yeah is she of scandinavian descent though i mean if her name is genuinely Freya, then I would assume so, but maybe not. Maybe her parents just read Deities and Demigods. It's just spelled with, with a K, yeah. Carlson. Eric Thor. He could change it. It's like a, a former band member her boyfriend's name was Eric K. Jacobson. I'm like, yeah, you're right off. You're right off the long ship now, aren't you? And he was a fairly large guy with the beard and he had the whole. He's very, very chill though, very calm, calm dude. It's like, yeah, you're right off. You're right off the long ship there. So should corruption come before essence? Well, alphabetically, it's not. I think I was trying to keep things alphabetical. Well, no, I guess I wasn't. Essence should probably come before corruption. 
because corruption is what impacts essence. So in terms of hierarchy of information, you should provide the core. Oh no, that's right, because it's not, well, no, neither is that. It's not derived from anything else, so it's a static, static start. Yep. Yeah. I always joke around like most of the Norwegians I know are very short. Well, so again though, this is our very much a modern context of what religion is and how it's facilitated. Clerics are right out of the middle age version of a warrior priest, right? They're not necessarily representative of religious figures of non-Romanized culture. You know, original D&D is, is medievally sourced, sourced in medieval Europe. It's and the mythology and history of medieval Europe. So uh, again, that part of what I like that's happening in some of these games is we are pulling in these threads of non-Romanized Eurocentric culture. And that's one of my goals with this game. Though I do have a Romanesque culture. I mean, they're more like House Harkonnen, but you know, they're there, which were basically the degenerate Romans in Dune, you know, so it's, yeah. No divinities from which to channel power. Well, like I said, one of the gifts that I took out of this version of the game was a blessed by the gods sort of gift that allowed a person to not necessarily be a cleric, but be an avatar or a channel of one of the gods or goddesses of this world from one of the cultures. Now, again, just like real human culture, each one of the six cultures has their own pantheon. And of course, theirs is right. Theirs is the real one. Nobody else's is, right? So it got very complicated. And I, I just pulled it out of the game for now. I'm like, oh, that's expansion book material, you know. I I was like, this the amount that I would have to write just for this gift is a whole supplemental book, which I just I need to get the game done. So um that's <laughs> that's kind of where I left that. That and the whole shape shifting thing. Pseudo scanning and some add-ins of Joe Grumby's first law, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. Well, there's a lot of evidence. So there's a lot of evidence that the Indo-European tribes spread out and where they landed determined it. So there is this there is a lot of modern research going to this idea that Scandinavia and India had the same root culture. And there is a lot of crossover in terms of their visions of the supernatural. And then how from their environment shaped the culture. And there was also a lot of romanticization with rom romanticism. And we talked about this earlier today and last night of the mythical Aryan culture, which is this weird hybrid of Asiatic and Scandinavian cultish superiority that was then propagated by the spiritualists and the mystics around the turn of the century it was it's very strange you know and we talked a little about tecumel the game the game written um i forget his name by the professor in the 80s that had this whole fantasization fantasizing of of asian culture combined with kind of south american aspects but the guy was a total bigot when it came to Semitic people and Africans. You know, and it was crazy, like when you reread some of this guy's comments and letters today, and you realize he was just like a screaming racist and a bigot, you know, but there were these certain cultures he had developed this fantastic idolization of, which which is so contradictory to me, you know, how you can say, well, these people were these pure um, mystical savages, you know, the noble savage, mystical primitive people and then oh but those other people who you know who i deal with every day they're they're not humans you know and, and obviously i won't play or run his game uh which is sad because when you first read his game it's very interesting because he got has some very deep cultural even linguistic development 
But then you go and read some of the things that were written about him by his colleagues and people who had contact with him, and you find out that oh, he was a horrible person. <laughs> so, unfortunately, I was actually going to do a, a little bit of a talk about his game, too, at some point. And I'm like, yeah, no. And I also brought up Varg. Varg from Burzum, who recently wrote his Norse fantasist RPG. His white Aryan RPG. Again, I just, like that guy, I'm just like, oh my god, you're still around. So no one will let you perform live anymore, so now you'll just write a, write a racist role-playing game. I don't know anything about the system, about the game. I've heard it's exceedingly complex and laden with all this, you know, might of the North stuff. <laughs> so, so clearly that's not on my Amazon wish list. It's kind of crazy when all this stuff gets intermingled, you know. But yeah, as far as the, the culture thing, right. And, and religion's a big part of it. And I haven't even really dug into writing up the religions of these cultures in this world. Largely because this is a whole other task. It's this whole other thing. Fucking Var, yeah, I know. You can't get away from them, right? It's like, man, I thought you were gone. Like, even Norway kicked you out. You know, like, uh, do, you know how, do you know how hard you have to work to not be rehabilitated by the, by the Norwegian prison system? I mean, I've met Gall. Like, I've met him. I've sat down and talked to the guy in person. And he talked about the prison system and his rehabilitation and his coming to grips with his own persona. And, you know, and here's a guy that, yeah, I mean, he still is out there. He's still black metal. He's still very intimidating to, to interact with because he's very big. He's a troll, first of all. You know, you're like, wow, this guy's, this guy's, this guy, okay, I take it back. He's the one really big Norwegian I know. Um, but... Then, like, a lot of the people that know him also knew Varg and were actually friends with him in high school. And I've, I've talked to them. And they're like, yeah, at some point he just went off the deep end. They're like, at some point he started believing all of that stuff that we used to all do and say because we were stupid kids and wanted to just shock our parents. At some, at some point, Varg just, you know, that's who he was. Including all the racist shit. And it's like, yeah, nope. Well, right. And, and I, you know, I said that last night, too. First of all, these are fantasy games. I don't expect anybody. I don't expect anybody to limit their experience based on my extrapolations of history, right? That's not, that's not what this is about. This is about... My game is Sword and Sorcery. You are supposed to be a person with a giant, ridiculous two-handed sword maybe taking out 30, you know... 30 demon cultists or whatever. Like, like that is part of the game. I don't expect this to not be fun. I talked about that with gender roles a little bit too. Because the gender roles came up. And I'm like, you know, I'm never going to be that guy who says, you, you can't play this character because in my imaginary culture, there's no women who do this. I mean, come on. I mean, that goes beyond gaming. That goes beyond just being a you-know-what. <laughs> you know? And I have seen it. I have seen it. So. All right, friends. I think, unfortunately, um, I'm getting to the point that I need to run and take care of a few other things. Thanks for everybody who tuned in today. And we will... Let's continue these chats. Continue these chats soon. Pop off the work share. Pop off. Pop up my usual spiel. Let's go see a beach a little bit. Yeah, I'll see Blake and Tom. See them later tonight. Right. I mean, there's a lot. So in my in my game, there's also a druidic culture, a druidic magic system that's embraced by one of the cultures. So yeah, I mean, it, it exists. Um, but again, I would never want to limit that either. I would never, you know. Well, 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 let's all get back to this. Let's let's get back to this. This this is this is going to be interesting. Maybe we'll continue this when I return. But for now, thanks again. I'll run through the usual. If you're on Twitch, you know where we're at. If you'd like what you're doing, see you later. Well, if you like what we're doing, stop over to the YouTube channel. Subscribe there. If you're seeing this on YouTube, head on over to Twitch if you want to get in on the live conversations and live broadcasts. 
Uh, there's there's my trusty Nightbot, which hasn't tried to kill me yet. Talking about FoxandBoardGames.com. Everything that I'm talking about, uh, as far as the game dev, you can follow it there and also get links to social media. To everybody who is logged in today and who has logged in on the various chats, the Wednesday night chats, thank you very much. Wouldn't be doing this if I didn't have people tuning in to see what we're doing and participate and follow what I'm doing. Uh, as I said, I'll be gone for about, about 10 days from here on out, I think. I have vacation mode up in stream. Hopefully, I'll be back either the following Wednesday or, if not Wednesday, then definitely Thursday. So, I'll see you all. Thanks again. Thanks for stopping by.